Welcome and thank you very much for joining the Campfire Chat, Governing Solar Radiation Modification Research, Insights from Marine Cloud Brightening and the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, this is the first in a series of offerings from C2G, the Carnegie Climate Governance Initiative, and they've begun to be running broadly on a weekly basis, covering a range of governance issues about different sorts of climate altering techniques or climate engineering or geoengineering, you might call it. So I'll say a few words about C2G, what it is, what we do, and then introduce the speakers that we have today. So C2G is uh, an independent initiative of the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs, funded by the Rasmussen, IKEA and Oak Foundations, for which we're very grateful. We seek to catalyze the creation of effective governance around these sorts of technologies. We don't have a view on whether they're good or bad or whether we should or shouldn't do them, but rather we believe a governance debate is very important, essential indeed, if they're ever to be used in a safe and appropriate way. So we're impartial, uh, but encourage debate. The idea of a campfire chat is that this is a an informal conversation. Imagine, if you will, we're sat around a campfire. It's even time, the, uh, the dark is drawing in, it's a cosy environment, and some friends are here to, to explore and chew the fat around these issues. And we hope that's a, an interesting and useful way of speaking about these kind of topics. So with that in mind, we turn to this marine cloud brightening and the experiment. In April this year, the first ever outdoors experiment on marine cloud brightening, indeed solar radiation modification, was undertaken. This was a test to attempt to spray some salt particles into the air above the, the barrier reef. The idea being that if you can change the cloud structures above the barrier reef, make them brighter, you may be able to cool the waters below it. And the study has suggested, their modeling has suggested, that perhaps um, you might be able to achieve a 70% reduction in the bleaching stress on the reef over an area of up to 400 square kilometers, if this were to be successful. So this project is funded by the Reef Restoration Adaptation Program um, in Australia and funded by the Reef Partnership. And to discuss this today in our campfire, we have three speakers who we're tremendously grateful to for joining us. We have Karen Brent from the University of Adelaide. Karen's a member of the Australian Forum for Climate Intervention Governance and comes from the, the law governance world. Now, Karen is not a member of this um, geo uh, uh, um, Great Barrier Reef project. She's very much an interested observer, um, takes a keen interest in it, but is not a member of the project, and it's important to say that. We have Sylvia, um, Sylvia Ribeiro, who's the Latin American director from the ETC group. Uh, the ETC group is a body that takes a keen interest in promoting and um, encouraging the engagement of civic societies and others in, a, in a, a plural debate about the adaptation, the development, and perhaps the, even the uptake of new technologies, including the sorts of technologies we're discussing today. And then we have Phil Williamson. Phil's from the School of Environmental Sciences at the University of East Anglia. And he has uh, been working in this broadfield for, for many years, I think probably 15 years or so. So has a wealth of experience to draw from in this conversation. So we're going to move forward now into the discussion. And to start with, um, we're going to have a conversation um, about uh, from Phil, firstly, he's going to say a few words about marine cloud brightening, what it is, why we might use it, why it might be useful. After that, Karen will say a few words about the project in the Great Barrier Reef and issues around governance. And then Sylvia will address some of the socioeconomic types of issues from the ETC perspective, each in turn sharing some slides. And having done that, we'll start a conversation. In the meantime, we have a question and answer facility. You can click on the Q&A button below. Pose any questions you would like, and we'll address those as we go through the conversation. If you particularly like a question that's popped up, then you can vote for it, and it'll come up the list so we can see it. And those that are more popular, we're, uh, we're more likely to address. So feel free to use that. So having said those few words, I'll hand over now to Phil to talk to us a little bit about MCB, and then the other panel members will say a few words too. Thank you, Phil. 
Thank you very much, Paul. And uh, I have a short presentation to provide a, an introduction. Uh, and thank you, Paul, for, for the introduction for me. Um, not really a correction, but actually the first work on, uh, on ocean fertilization was 30 years ago this summer when I gave a presentation on, on possible uh, cooling of the climate through ocean fertilization. Now, that did lead into various other activities in, involved, but I never actually went out and did the studies, uh, but I got involved in the, in the science administration program arrangement. So anyway, over to the slides that I have on marine cloud brightening. I'll give the scientific context, and similar to Paul, saying neither right nor wrong, but let's just find some information about it as background. If I go to, hopefully, it will now give you the slide now. Um, I will put it onto full screen, and if you, hopefully, you'll be able to see most of the information that, that matters on there, and then I'll work my way through it. Okay, question, what, what is cloud brightening? What's involved? Does it actually work? And a little bit of introduction before handing over to the carrying on the specific study that we have in mind. Okay, well, the, what, what's, why, why are we doing it? What's, what, what's the, the, the theory behind it? And it's based on, on cloud structure and that uh, it's not necessarily creating clouds from nothing at all. But it's where there are clouds there to make them uh, brighter and whiter to reflect more sunlight back into, into space. And that this, uh, you need to know something a little bit about the physics of cloud formation and that the clouds start with small particles in the atmosphere uh, and these are called cloud condensation nuclei. And if, if there's none at all there then there's no clouds and you have a clear blue sky. It's possible to have water vapor in the sky and not to have any clouds if you don't have any of these small starting particles. Now, uh, Depending on where it is on your screen you should be able to see some sort of vapor trails that they look like aircraft trails and in fact those are ships plumes uh, and that ships they don't always form uh, vapor trails and contrails but in certain conditions then the uh, the emissions from uh, a ship's funnel uh, can form clouds and and this it isn't uh, the pollution from from the ship um, that, but that's making the cloud it's the water vapor in the sky although it is stimulated started off uh, by the small droplets that come out of the, of, of the ship's funnels but that was Sort of one of the starting points for thinking about these ideas. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, something coming out of the back of a ship or the, or the funnel of a ship. Uh, it can also, clouds can form naturally over the ocean uh, by water spray and droplets and waves breaking. Uh, and this is one of the main natural sources. Uh, droplets of water, the water evaporates, leaves the salt behind, and that forms the starting point from, uh, for a cloud. And so that the theory is that if you uh, do this artificially if you have a device and these were designed more than 10 years ago uh, that uh, possibly pumping water up from the ocean uh, on, on the, the slide is the first sort of artist's impression of what they might look like and this uh, this was idea was put forward 30 years ago just as a, as a concept. Uh, now subsequently uh, we've been thinking about what well, could it actually work and, and what one does then is, is put these into global models of, of, of how the atmosphere works and you see that with some extra particles that might be created over the oceans and that the, the simplest assumption is that well you try it sort of almost everywhere in the ocean although there's some parts of the world where it works more effectively than others and when, when one did that added these extra nuclei then the, the model results showed that one could get extra clouds this could get extra warming and the, the, the blue areas on the map if you see those show that where extra warming, uh, that, that, sorry, not extra warming, but the cooling effect of counteracting the warming, where the, where the cooling would be greatest. Now this is over the ocean, uh, over land it either doesn't have any cooling uh, or slight warming, but it does affect the rainfall over land, and particularly if you're looking at the, the Pacific and you saw that there was a lot of cooling in an area uh, to, the, the, uh, to the west of South America, uh, that has an effect on the the rainfall over South America and so that this was uh, once you start changing the weather patterns around the world then it does have implications so that was one uh, early uh, result from the modeling uh, it could be counter argument as well one just has to choose your careful you choose your locations carefully where you do it to avoid those effects it also uh, gave the idea that well, maybe it isn't such a, a brilliant idea to do it for the world as a whole 
if you're going to do it more localized, going to do it more targeted, uh, then the, the, the risks of changing the whole world's weather system, uh, but it still could have advantages in producing local cooling, particularly, and, and this might uh, be used for uh, either reducing the strength of hurricanes or diverting them or protecting particularly sensitive uh, ecosystems such as coral reefs. In that context, it's been taken up by uh, the Australians and thinking, well, could this work on a, on a local or regional basis? Uh, and that the, whether or not it does work is still undecided because it's still uh, in, in the, in the modelling phase and that the, the measurements uh, to work out whether it would be effective, uh, some results indicate it would be, some don't, and there's still papers being written saying, well, perhaps it might not work after all. And the, the, the best way of trying it out is to test it uh, at a small scale where uh, the chances of any uh, impact or damage uh, be no more than, than, than a ship's uh, funnel, uh, the, the, the plume from a ship going by, uh, possibly producing some cloud or possibly not. Uh, there's a quote at the bottom uh, by one of the, uh, the, the pioneers of these studies, uh, and I think that if you can see that, that indicates the, the caution uh, and, and the, uh, the, the scientific approach saying, well, we don't know whether this is going to work or not, uh, but we need to, to find out to establish that there are no significant adverse consequences. So that was uh, a quote by, by, by Latham a few years ago, but it still stands now. In the context for the Great Barrier Reef, very briefly, as Karen will be going into this uh, uh, in greater detail, and uh, it's, I think we're all aware of the damage of, uh, of global warming and ocean warming on corals and bleaching events, and that the Australians have already lost a lot of the Great Barrier Reef, and these bleaching events seem now almost to be an annual event, and it's causing very real damage and very real concern. Uh, and that the idea of using marine cloud brightening was just one of the thoughts by uh, this uh, reef restoration adaptation program. They're also investigating a whole series of other possible options. Uh, and the, the, the trial that took place, I think it was late March or early April, uh, it, it was, was spraying sea salt. They wanted to know whether they could use a, a snow blower to modify it, whether the, the, sea, the sea spray formed the, the salt crystals. And they were able to do that and test it and detect it five kilometers away. It wasn't at a sufficient scale to, to brighten clouds. Now, in order for the process to work at all in saving coral reefs, it does require that other activities, uh, particularly global emission reductions, and this is where we can discuss whether or not Australia is doing enough to, to, to meet the, the global targets, but the, the MCB on its own would not uh, it would do very little to, to rescue and save uh, Australian coral reefs. It would need to be uh, with other interventions and other measures. Uh, I'll stop there now and hand over to Karen, who will now pick up the story and say uh, what uh, what's happening at present. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Phil, and um, thank you, Paul, for organising this event. Um, so, picking up uh, from Phil, um, I've been invited here today to talk about a few things from an Australian perspective, and one is the context in which this uh, experiment took place. So I'll elaborate a little bit more on uh, what's happening on the reef and the reef restoration adaptation program or the RAP as we call it. Um, but also to talk a little bit about governance, uh, both at a domestic and at an international level. So I'll just share my screen. So, um, Thank you, Phil, for doing a great job of kind of introducing the experiment and what it aimed to do. And I think it's important to stress before moving on that the purpose of the experiment was just to test the delivery mechanisms. My understanding is that there was no intention to have uh, any kind of climatic impact uh, from the test. Um, but to look at the context, um, as Phil said, these plans to develop marine cloud brightening are part of this broader suite of interventions that are being funded by the Australian federal and state governments um, to enhance the resilience of the Great Barrier Reef. And so for those of you who aren't as familiar with the reef, um, got a great satellite image there up there on the screen. Um, 
you know, the reef isn't just a reef, it's a series of reefs that extends over 2,000 kilometres along the northeast coast of Australia, so off, most of it off the coast of Queensland. Um, it's a World Heritage listed site. Um, and not only is it a site of great natural um, beauty, um, it's also, um, you know, in economic terms, worth tens of billions of dollars per annum to the Australian and the Queensland economies. Now, climate change poses a number of threats to the reef's ecosystems and its biodiversity. And uh, one in particular that, that Phil mentioned is that climate change will increase the frequency and severity of these coral bleaching events. And what these are is where there has been a prolonged period uh, of above maximum average water temperatures, usually in summer, um, and that can uh, cause the coral to expel the, um, the algae that live within them. And this causes the coral to bleach, to turn white, and can kill the coral entirely if it's severe, and, and it can therefore have quite devastating effects on reef ecosystems. And look, in the summer just past, so the summer of uh, 2019 and 2020, the Great Barrier Reef experienced its third mass bleaching event in five years. Um, and this bleaching event wasn't just remarkable because it has followed on so, so soon from recent bleaching events, but it's the first time all three regions of the reef, the north, the central, and the southern regions of the reef experienced bleaching in the same event. Um, now, the Australian government and Queensland governments have been funding research into how to boost the resilience of the reef and its capacity to withstand climate change impacts. This includes marine heat waves and bleaching events. And as I said, the research is being coordinated through this program, the Reef Restoration and Adaptation Program, or the RAP. And what the RAP is, is it's a partnership between government and non-government research organisations. And this includes Australia's National Science Agency, the, the CSIRO, um, the government body that's responsible for managing the Great Barrier Reef Marine Parks, so the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, or Gabrumpa, as we often call it, um, there's also a, a leading public institution uh, that conducts tropical research uh, called the Australian Institute of Marine Science, Science as well as a number of Australian universities. Um, so this program, as Phil indicated, it includes research into a really wide range of things. Um, it includes things like coral reef stabilisation, the creation of, of artificial reefs, uh, coral regeneration projects, as well as the management of other stresses on the reef, including things like invasive species, um, such as the crown of, um, crown of thorn starfish. But one category of these interventions that are being investigated um, are cooling and shading mechanisms. And these aim to prevent coral stress during heat waves by lessening the amount of sunlight that warms the water of the reef, uh, or by some of them by mixing cooler water with the warmer water on top of the reef um, to lower those temperatures. And so MCB, marine flood brightening, falls within this, this suite of cooling and shading proposals. Um, and look, this campfire chat is quite timely that it's happening this week. Um, because the Reef Trust Partnership, and this is the body that administers the funding to the RAP, um, it released its work plan for the next um, 12 months earlier this week. Uh, the work plan indicates that um, I think it's 4.77 million Australian dollars worth of government funding um, has been allocated to cooling and shading research uh, over the next 12 months. Um, so that's quite a significant sum. Uh, and the report also states that um, it expects deliverables from this research um, being, and I'm quoting here, 
proof of concept, including environmental impact and regulatory assessment. So it gives you some idea of where this research is going in the near future. And look, if you're interested, check out The Guardian, um, the online newspaper. It had an article yesterday that stated that about half of that funding, that, that 4.77 million Australian dollars, will be devoted to atmospheric modelling and monitoring for marine cloud brightening. Uh, and about 1.8 million dollars in additional funding is going to be provided uh, by some of the government and university institutions that are affiliated with this research. And this includes, again, Australia's National Science Agency, the CSIRO, um, as well as other universities and research bodies associated. So I guess what you need to take away, or, or what I, I think um, the message I'd like to, to um, pack on to the end of this slide is that marine cloud brightening is a small part of a much bigger research program that is aimed at protecting and enhancing the resilience of the Great Barrier Reef. It's not a program about um, climate engineering or geoengineering or, or SRM per se. Um, though marine cloud brightening as a smaller part of that program certainly seems to be attracting a lot more uh, attention, particularly these days. Before moving on to governments, I'll just explain a little bit more about the RAP um, and what they're doing. And as I said, look, it's easy to get the impression um, that this is all about the science, about developing the technologies, developing the interventions. Uh, but if you visit their website, and I strongly recommend that you do if this is uh, something that you research on or you're interested in learning more because it's quite comprehensive, you'll see that the scope of the program is much broader than just doing the science. Um, it includes uh, things like stakeholder engagement and governance research. Um, and so you, the RAP has you know, already published a number of reports uh, on some of its early research regarding stakeholder engagement and governance. Um, you'll see in some of those reports that the RAP acknowledges the importance of governance to the success of the um, program as a whole, uh, not just the development of marine cloud brightening, but to other in interventions and that overall goal of enhancing the resilience of the reef. Um, they have a detailed uh, preliminary assessment on there of the regulatory environment within which all these interventions, not just marine cloud brightening, but all the interventions will be conducted in. Um, and it's also published some early findings on um, some stakeholder engagement activities that they've conducted. And this includes with reef stakeholders and um, indigenous owners. Um, and so this early research uh, was aimed at assessing the social acceptability of different interventions. And by the looks of things, we'll go on to inform further stakeholder engagement activities. So in terms of governance, uh, the big thing I want to stress here is that the experiment did not take place in some kind of governance vacuum. It was conducted under existing rules of Australian domestic environmental laws that apply to activities on the Great Barrier Reef. And now look, for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, the Australian legal system, we're a federated country. So we have multiple levels of government and multiple levels of rules. Uh, it can be a little bit of a complex system, particularly where environmental laws and regulations are concerned. And look, the Great Barrier Reef is not immune to this complexity. Um, but what this means is that for activities on the reef, like the experiment that took place, there are both Commonwealth environmental laws and potentially also state environmental and planning laws that apply to these kind of activities. Um, there's also multiple government authorities that um, you know, may issue or, or require, be required to issue permits for such processes like the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority. And again, if you're interested in going into the, the nitty gritty of this, check out the RAP's regulatory assessment report findings. Um, so look, at the end of the day, uh, they in their report acknowledge that this system may not be perfect and that there may be further development that's needed, particularly around uh, assessment and approval processes and the governance of these novel technologies, these new untested science and technologies uh, and how they are governed and regulated. 
Um, so it'll be interesting to see, and at least I'm very interested to see uh, what is, um, you know, what comes out of their research and what kind of rules are developed. And before I wrap up, I just want to finish with a few comments about international law. Um, and look, I'm, I'm saying this because I know a number of folks who are maybe watching this um, either live or streamed later on are probably wondering about a few key um, decisions uh, that have taken place and how they might apply. And the first is the that back in um, 2010, the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity had a conference of the party decision, which um, invites um, states to ensure that no climate related geoengineering activities that may uh, affect biodiversity uh, take place until there's adequate scientific and um, this is often mistakenly referred to as a prohibition or moratorium on geoengineering activities. And I say mistakenly because it's neither of these things. Uh, this decision was just a decision by the Conference of the Parties. And this means that it's not an amendment to the Convention and it's not legally binding on any states. And the choice of words of invites really suggests that this is more of a hope or a wish rather than an imperative that states have to follow. And the other thing I want to touch on is uh, the London Protocol, which is part of the international regime on marine pollution um, and preventing marine pollution from the dumping of waste at sea. And as many people watching would know, in 2013, parties to the London Protocol adopted an amendment on marine geoengineering. This is a really significant development because it's the first time states have gotten together and tried to develop legally binding rules. However, its capacity to govern marine cloud brightening is limited in a number of respects. And the first is that this rule, these amendments are not yet in force. Um, it needs um, around 30 five out of 53 states to accept the amendment uh, before it becomes uh, operative and legally binding and enforceable. And at the moment, only last I checked, only six states have done so, uh, most recently being Germany. So we're nowhere near that threshold number yet. Um, and of those states, Australia isn't one of them. Uh, international law is a consent-based system. Um, and Australia hasn't consented to be bound by this amendment. So even if it enters into a force until Australia accepts it, it's not going to be bound by its rules anyway. Um, at the moment, the amendment only contains particular rules regarding ocean fertilisation. Um, and even if it could govern, um, you know, even if it was changed and other, you know, technologies are added, it's questionable whether at the end of the day it could actually govern marine cloud brightening. Um, and this is something that some international lawyers have, have raised due to the wording of the operative provision that suggests it might only apply uh, to uh, things that are placed directly into the water. Again, the question of interpretation, there are a few different views out there, but it could be quite determinative at the end of the day. But this doesn't mean there's no relevant rules of international law to any marine cloud brightening. There's a whole patchwork of rules out there, but their application is going to depend on things, um, you know, like where uh, an activity is conducted, which state is responsible for it, and what the likely impacts are going to be at the end of the day. So I think I'll leave it there and hand over to, um, to Sylvia. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Silvia Ribeiro. I am the Latin America Director for ETC Group, which is a small international organization. And um, I am also uh, like kind of the focal point of ETC Group on geoengineering. And we have been working on these issues for more than 10 years now, following the issue from the civil society perspective. I will now uh, share the screen. So, um, I want, to, I want to provide some critical questions on this discussion and on geoengineering experiments. Uh, just rapidly mentioned that there is a wide opposition to geoengineering from civil society. Uh, we have like an overarching campaign, which is the, what we call the home campaign, the Hands of Mother Earth campaign, where 190 organizations, including 31 organization, international organizations in our participating and there are 45 countries represented. But it's also among them La Via Campesina, 
uh, Indigenous Environmental Network, Friends of Earth International. Uh, the Climate Action Network, which is not a member as such of the Home Campaign, has an own position which says that they strongly opposes deployment of solar radiation management and strongly opposes real world experiments. The key, the key positions from this uh, civil society is uh, particularly because geoengineering is seen as excuse to avoid and delay real emissions reductions and it's a kind of alibi to the fossil fuel industry and other industries to continue emitting greenhouse gases. It is a, high, it's a set of high risk proposals that are non testable at the scale required to influence climate. So we are, it will also have many environmental and unequal impacts in different parts of the world and deep and existing inequities. So because of that, we are for a ban on geoengineering and especially on solar radiation management. Uh, we also think that precautionary moratoria taken at the Convention on Biological Diversity and London Protocol and Convention are important. So generally on um, geoengineering governance, uh, I would like to say that we don't think that the separation in solar and carbon dioxide removal is useful because it focuses on technical aspects instead of the impacts on ecosystem and socioeconomic impacts and other. And it's difficult to draw a clear line between experiments and the investment in research and experiments and the commitments to future deployment. So we definitely think that governance must come before experiments and it has to be UN-based, multilateral, democratic, transparent and preceded by a bottom-up wide social debate that is not happening at this moment. It's more like a general debate. We need much more debate among societies and inside societies. So on the particular uh, experiment, this experiment we are discussing today, we will contend that Australia or local governments can regulate geoengineering. Of course, national regulations applies everywhere in Australia or everywhere, and they have to be respected. But MCB, like marine cloud brighton and at large scale could have really serious transboundary negative impacts as some of them mentioned by Phil Williamson at the beginning. And it could even extend to areas beyond, beyond national jurisdictions. So this is not only like a local decision or a national decision. Uh, also the MCB experiment, this one, a small one that was done now, is not planned to be isolated. It is thought to continue and be much larger and complemented with other geoengineering approaches and other approaches. And also just to remind that the reef destruction is multifactorial. And uh, for instance, ocean acidification and industrial pollution are key, and they are not addressed at all by marine cloud brightening. Marine cloud brightening is basically theoretical and refer to only one aspect of the reef crisis, but it could paradoxically help to justify a slower reduction of greenhouse gases in general. So one key element we think is that it has to be free prior informed consent, not only because of CDB, London Convention, but also because of international human law, indigenous declaration on, on, on indigenous rights, uh, I mean, UN declaration on indigenous rights, etc. There are at least 70 Aboriginal uh, traditional owner groups and other communities that are connected to the reef, many communities at consultation and free prior informed consent of traditional owners and local communities on the impacts of the technique, not the isolated experiments, but the experiments, how they are planned, and the full scale and context of the whole project. This is what has to be consulted and not fragmented, separated. It has to be shared with population and particularly indigenous peoples what the impacts may be, what are the problems they may be suffering of this when it's deployed at larger scale. So a survey is definitely not free prior informed consent, but still uh, the, not public perception or social acceptability issues, they are not consultation. But according to the RAP project report on a stakeholder traditional owner uh, and community engagement assessment, some of these were generally mentioned by Kerry, climate change and genetic modification of the reef are the most rejected option among all the options presented. The public perceived cloud brightening to have more risk than benefits. This is from 
your own text. Uh, stakeholders strongly cautioned, cautioned against overemphasis on a costly and misguided technical fix at the expense of a more holistic approach from communities and community engaged approach that is on threat reaction, that is acidification, that, that, is, that is coastal pollution, and it's also, you know, how to prevent warming. But this is, this is, the, this is what is taken from the URAM survey, the survey of the project. So on the CBD, of course, the CBD has a very important decision, which is uh, a de facto moratorium. None of the conventions, none of the Rio conventions, including climate change or anything, has like what you formally call legally bending, but all states are expected to follow what is taken by consensus, which is the fact in, with the Convention on Biological Diversity. And a moratorium is a provisory measure. So of course, all countries in Australia too are expected to follow this. And many other countries like Germany, like Canada, has acted on experiments following the moratorium. So parties know that this is a moratorium. The moratorium, though, provides for small-scale scientific research studies, and, the MC, and clearly the project, the MCB project, is not on a controlled setting. And I don't know. So you mentioned it, it will be uh, environmental impact assessment, but particularly on a larger scale, this should be prior to not be violating these provisions from the CBD. Uh, I, I will also lastly mention that the Great Barrier Reef Foundation, who fund, funds and coordinated the RAP, uh, has a really kind of difficult corporate partners because they are the major greenhouse emitters from both mining and aviation industry. And that includes BHP, Oreca, Rio Tinto, Boeing, Qantas. One of the foundation's largest funders, this is, this is like the foundation that manages the trust that is funding you know, the RAP program. Uh, it's Australia's single largest greenhouse gas emitter. So this is, this, we, as we, as I mentioned from the very beginning, we find this kind of connection extremely difficult because it shows the interest of these uh, high greenhouse gas emitting companies in providing technical techno fixes to avoid real reductions. So what we need is action on climate change and action on climate change and the reef is so urgent and important that we really can't lose time with the speculative techno fixes and emergency measures. We need to focus on the causes, on real solutions, and that is drastic real reduction of uh, gases, but also in relation to the reef, to the real causes and the full, like the communities, when they were asked, not consulted, uh, said they want to have a much more holistic approach. And here are a few sources of information that you can go further if you want to see these kind of critical views. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all very much indeed for, for your contributions. Um, we'll make the slides available um, afterwards so people can catch up on the coordinates, the contacts and information that was on those if they would like to. And we now have some questions coming in, which is super. I'm going to start off by posing um, a question to you all um, to answer as you feel um, you would like to. Um, this experiment was the first, uh, the first MCB, the first solar radiation modification experiment, and there's been quite a lot of contention around this space for many years. However, when this experiment took place, there was, one might say, a muted response from the, the global community, from the public, from the research community. And I wonder, th did that surprise you in any way? Uh, would you have expected a more of a response? We think back to you know, the response to the, an idea of spice, of spraying water out of a hose pipe, um, causing uproar. I just wondered, is there something about this context, the Barrier Reef being a special and important place that's valued by people and a willingness for people to protect that or the scale of the project or something about MCB? So yeah, were you surprised at this level of response? Paul, I don't know how you expect us to answer, but I could say something. <laughs> yeah, please do. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, this was in the middle of a pandemic. In fact, I think it was an extraordinarily bad timing for many reasons to have this experiment. I mean, lack, lack of, lack of, 
lack of um, governance, lack of uh, really, you know, preparation and, and consulta real consultation with the public and in the middle of a pandemic where the world was looking to many other things except in this. I heard and read in the papers that even uh, researchers that were thought to be part of the experiment couldn't arrive. So from many, many reasons, I think, what could they think about doing the experiment at this time? Look, I'll just add to that as well. Um, a, it was a pandemic and B, Australia had just had the most, and it seems so long ago now, we had had a tr horrific summer of bushfires that was still very, particularly in April, was still very prominent in the public mind. Um, and those bushfires are now the um, subject of a royal commission, so a, a formal public inquiry. Um, and yeah, I think th this just wasn't on anyone's radar because of those reasons. My comment is a little bit different. And I think that the, the motivation for the, for the study is much more local and focused and it, it is more of a, a weather modification if the uh, study had been on cloud seeding and one can argue whether or not that ought to happen but it was not designed in the context of if this works it will solve the world's climate problem it is if this works it may help in preserving the great barrier reef that therefore when one looks at the, at the possible benefits and the possible impacts and the argument of whether or not and I can see the perspective saying uh, how can you possibly call this a small-scale experiment but from the point of view of, of, of the Great Barrier Reef and, and, and of the world it is a relatively small experiment the effects do not last more than a day or two if that therefore it is a very short study it is the, the possibility of any impacts saying whether or not it's controlled if, if you want to interpret control as being it's not in the laboratory, it's not absolutely managed in every regard, but it is controlled from a scientific experiment. You can have a control area where this is not happening, and the, the experiment, what does it produce? It produces salt crystals that, that happen anyway. Even if it were at a 10 times larger, 100 times larger scale, it would probably be no different in its possible biological impact than having a ship just sailing there and, and, and putting out. Uh, what the, 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 the pollution from, from, from a ship sack, which might have some cooling influence. So the, the implication that somehow this is sort of threatening the region uh, and, and is going to cause you know, biological harm, and everything we do causes some biological harm. We all the time you've got to think, well, what are the possible benefits? I don't think that it is a, a particularly sensible way of solving the climate problem. I don't think it, 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 it is scalable in, in a manageable way. But until you have the information, until you know what possible benefits you might have, I think it's very short-sighted just to say, we shall not study it, we shall not investigate it. Okay, thank you very much. We had a question that relates very directly to this point you were finishing up on, Phil, which was the extent to which there might be environmental risks associated with MCB experimentation. And, and indeed, I imagine deployment downstream and from, from what I'm hearing you say that the the likelihood is is low and that this is distributing salt particles that would happen as a result of wave action and wind action and so on is that is that correct are we missing something here the the uh, the possible damage from salt particles if it was at, at a scale thousands and thousands and thousands of times greater one could have more salt deposited on land and that could have an effect on biological productivity on land, but it, it is it is pretty small. Now, the, there could be some disturbance clearly to, 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 to marine ecosystems, but nothing like the scale of disturbance to marine ecosystems that we're now suffering from from, from, from climate change. Now, whether this is too little and too late, and, and whether the Great Barrier Reef, even if all these approaches uh, were proved to be effective, whether they could be implemented on the scale required to save the Great Barrier Reef, is questionable and that there's all sorts of criticism that can be made that Australia and other governments around the world aren't doing enough for, for climate change but I don't think it's it I don't think the faith that this is going to solve the answer is produce the answer has reduced uh, the, uh, the, the, the the ambition otherwise it's just that governments don't want to do it rather than oh we can find a, a, a technical fix thank you I, at one point there's been flagged in the question list um, 
uh, not particularly a question, but a statement, which I think is great. Um, MCB wouldn't affect ocean acidification in any way. It's not a, an attempt to address that in any way. They're separate agenda and issues entirely. It's a very diff different issue. And that there's, there's possibly secondary tertiary effects of having slight cooling. Uh, and that actually, if it's slight cooling, does that affect the carbon dioxide uptake? Actually, you might get more carbon dioxide uptake. As, uh, it depends on the counterfactual. But really, that the, 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 the threat is from uh, the, 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 the reef suffering from, and it's quite correct. Mostly at present, it's, it's bleaching. The ocean acidification affects recovery from bleaching and it affects the growth rates of corals. So, uh, without ocean acidification, the corals can grow back more rapidly if there is a bleaching event, if they do get wiped out in an area. But with, uh, you're, you're quite right that it, MCB uh, should not or does not uh, uh, affect ocean acidification in any way. Sylvia Karen, did you want to comment on that at all as well? No, I just want to say that there are a lot, like Phil mentioned, some of the potential potential impacts, and you know, uh, of course, these impacts has to be taken into account. But also, uh, the the as I said, the opinion of the people that are engaged and has been like the guardians of the reef for many many hundreds of years, and uh, the which which demand more holistic approaches, and those approaches are including how to address. And the, the main causes, which is pollution, acidification, and also warming. But if you don't address, and that is from Australia's government who put a lot of money on this, although there is also private money, uh, is if you don't address the continued emission of greenhouse, greenhouse gases, then the, the ocean will be continued acidificating. So, I mean, and that is a real problem. So it's like a contradiction. I mean, all geoengineering approaches has this, you know, they are at, at, at addressing some of the symptoms, theoretically, because it's not proven, but not the causes. So I think it's extremely important to go to the causes. That's my only comment. That takes us actually to the point of emissions to a, a question from Oliver Morton we have here. I shall read it out. Um, is there any evidence or anecdote on the question of whether a successful protection of the Great Barrier Reef, whether by MCB or some other cooling technique, would have an impact on Australian public opinion on the need for emissions reductions. For example, when Australians are asked why climate change is a problem, do a lot cite the Great Barrier Reef preservation? And perhaps I'll go to Karen first for that. Um, I guess the first thing I would say is most Australians that I meet, unless they're working in this space, are not well acquainted with what geoengineering or SRM as a broader issue might be. Um, so in terms of the reef though, uh, given that it's um, of such national significance, I think most Australians are quite concerned. Um, this is just a vibe, it's not necessarily, um, it's just, you know, most Australians even, you know, whether you're over the other side of the country are quite concerned with what's happening on the reef. Um, and I think it's important with this pro with this research to put it into that context that it's um, it's part of this suite of proposals addressing a lot of different vulnerabilities of, of the reef um, to uh, to climate change impacts, um, and so it's kind of in this um, suite of as, as the name says adaptation type proposals when um as phil's discussed you know you scale something like this up then it becomes more of a less of a weather modification slash adaptation type activity to more of a, a, a climate intervention climate engineering type activity uh, i just don't think many people in australia are aware of of either of those things um we also have a, a long history in this country of using cloud seeding and weather modifications. So that's not, I think, a particularly controversial issue uh, in Australia. It's been, you know, tested by our CSIRO and other scientists and carried out in large scale programs uh, for the better part of, of 60, 70 years. So again, you know, this is something that looks to a lay person maybe quite similar to, to some of the cloud seeding activities that have been carried on for a long time. That's interesting. Thank you. Uh, I just a question about the uh, slightly broader question, in fact, about the 
opening out of the, the debate uh, in the science community more widely of MCB and SRM beyond the um, defined geographies that have been having those conversations in the past. It's been predominantly a um, Western European and, an, and United States debate. Um, uh, but more recently, that's been broadening out. So the Australia, have the, an experiment, we've seen uh, papers being published from Benin uh, in um, Africa, and we have the Decimals Project, a research project funding a wide range of people working on SRM in the global south. Um, so do you think that kind of changing geographies of, of geoengineering is, is, a, is a good thing? Is it enhancing and changing the global debate? Um, or is it uh, uh, just a natural evolution of science? It won't particularly have a great deal to say about the governance of these things as they go forward. That was a question from Chloe Ludden, I should say. Thank you. Can I make a comment on Please that? Please do. Yeah, just chip <laughs> yeah, in. I just, I, just wanted, I just wanted to answer uh, to Karen, in fact, about this cloud, seed, uh, cloud seeding. And uh, you also mentioned that in some, in, in some document, Paul. And in fact, uh, it's not like that the cloud seeding is not controversial. It's just that uh, it, has, you know, it has been around for commercial purposes, mostly in many countries. I am not aware, I also, I, 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 sorry, I am aware and I have documentation uh, from communities that are suffering from drought, for instance, because they think that they are stealing grain there has been a trial in Ecuador from Cotopaxi uh, for a community that, you know, because of cloud seeding, there have been many protests in Mexico, there have many protests in Argentina, uh, and I don't know about Australia, but uh, that you are using cloud seeding, it doesn't mean that people are liking it or so. It's just that this debate hasn't taken force because in many cases, people doesn't realize what happened. And uh, it just, they just suffer the consequences. I also been in United Nations present in negotiations in the CBD where countries were suggesting that China's extensive program on cloud seeding and modific weather modification was affecting them uh, all in a very general kind of way <laughs> that uh, like uh, enhancing extreme weather events in their countries. And the largest weather modification uh, project, which is in China, in Tibet, the Tibet has no way of protesting to that. And they are, China is, you know, trying to develop this as a way of taking more water to the rivers they need and taking it from Tibet. And I don't think this is uncontroversial. I think this is highly controversial, but it hasn't, it hasn't really showed what the people that suffer in the bad consequences of these projects can say. So it's about cloud seeding. And on this about changing the debate to the South, I absolutely think it's extremely important because uh, mostly, you know, 10 countries are, 10 global, global North countries are responsible for the majority of greenhouse gas emissions, while most of the South are not responsible or have very little. Uh, and of course, we have to have the discussion on real solutions from the South. I don't think, though, that paying a few, uh, a few researchers in the South will make a difference. I think the difference will be in really taking this discussion to Southern const constituencies. I, there's a stream of questions. We are going to try and capture these and we will be able to share them later on, we hope. Um, and, and that might help the debate continue over time. In, moving forward. Uh, we've had quite a few questions about the, the Convention on Biological Diversity decision. Um, and I'm going to pick one here from uh, Andy Parker. It was, it's directed to Sylvia, but to, to everyone, please. Um, the, the CBD 2010 decision states that small scale outdoors research is allowed. Um, but the, uh, Sylvia was suggesting that that, that that may not be the case, I believe. So Andy says um, at the 216 ETC group campaign document argued that the 2010 CBD decision must be strengthened into a moratorium. Um, why does the ETC continue to feel that there's a need for this um, uh, in research? I think that's, that captures it. Um, so Sylvia, would you like to respond directly to that? Uh, yes, of course. I mean, we, in our campaign, we say uh, that we need to strengthen the moratorium to include uh, opener experiments. So this, for us, this is a shortcoming. Uh, we are aware that the moratorium, the CBD moratorium, 
uh, allows for uh, small scale experiments and research. Uh, but we don't see, we don't see to our knowledge that any of the proposed experiments, uh, not even MCD, has respected you know, the conditions for these small scale experiments. For instance, being in a control setting, uh, preceded from environmental impact assessment that has to be independent, of course. And uh, besides that, this has to be complemented, as I said, with human trust law that is in force, of course, and, and it's uh, about consultation and other things. And also then we have this discussion, and that's the reason why we opposed open air experiments, of the difficulty to draw a clear line between the investments in open air experiments and the, this how this entrenched the deployment of these projects on a larger scale and to geoengineering finally. So that is our position. Thank you. Karen, as a geo uh, governance person, did you want to come back on that at all? Um, I think um, like there's something worth adding is, is, you know, there isn't a clear definition of geoengineering. Um, and I think this, um, at least not in, in the CBD, um, regime and I think this experiment does raise that question of not just what technologies might be labeled or brand as geoengineering climate engineering but again that question of scale and purpose becomes relevant and you know as someone interested in law and governance I think it, it's you know it, it is also an important question if we think about well hey how are we going to develop uh, rules for, for governing these technologies into the future, then, you know, we need to think carefully about questions of scale, questions of purpose, um, you know, to enable responsible research to progress, um, you know, without, you know, opening the door to, to large scale ungoverned, you know, activities that could have transboundary impacts and effects. So it's just a in the um, spirit of the campfire I'll throw out there. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. We, we're very nearly at the end of our time. I just invite the, the panellists if they have a few words they'd like to sum up with very quickly before we uh, go offline shortly. I'll, I'll have a comment that I think that there is a, uh, a quite a lot of documentation on this study I and mean, it's certainly not a, I wouldn't count it as a rogue study, I think it, it is, it does have uh, various uh, uh, governance mechanisms in place, they might be further strengthened, I don't think we should uh, dismiss it, and we want to get as much information as possible out of it. But I think that the, the, the way that it's going, it doesn't look as though it will be the solution. And I think it's, it's, it's actually to know that is very important because then we will say, right, this does not, it, it, the, the, the purpose of science is to advise, advance knowledge and information and understanding. Otherwise, we'll have this problem for the next 50 or 100 years, say, would it work, might it work? But if we know that it doesn't work, or what conditions, uh, are, are applied. So I think we need to have the, the, the knowledge and the information to assess it and to, the, the scale that it's carried out uh, and has been carried out up until now has not been uh, at all uh, or any likelihood of any damage, no more or less than on the ship going out there to, 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 to do the study in the first place or people driving around to, uh, to, 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 to go to the docks, something like that. Thank you. So do we have time for a final comment? Yes, please do. Uh, okay, I, I just want to say that, um, and also in response to Phil, I am very grateful for Phil's contribution in many fields, including knowledge about the technologies. And so I would say that the, this the technical part of the technologies uh, uh, is a minor part of the geoengineering debate. The, the governance debate is, it has a lot of social, economic, geopolitical the impacts and also the differences on the impacts that could affect more regions that hasn't been taken, you know, the, any initiative on geoengineering and has to be part of the decision. All this is a, such a complex uh, discussion that uh, we should have this discussion and a governance in place before we start like entrenching technological and experimental you know um, facts we, which is just a minor part of the whole debate the real debate is about do we want this or do we want to go other other ways to confront climate change because this is the main question it's not change near not change near and it's about how do we confront the real causes of climate change so we really can do something about it 
Thank you. Thank you for this debate and thank you to C2G for inviting and for the contributions of panelists and participants. Thank you, Sylvia. Karen, did you want to? Um, yeah, look, uh, I just want to say that I think the significance of this experiment isn't that it was a first. I think the significance is the context it's happening in, it's happening within um, an existing body of rules alongside a broader project um, in which the, the, you know, people running the project are going to be trying to develop rules to govern um, interventions on the reef as part of, of that process as, as, alongside um, doing the experiments, doing the science. And I think whatever we, we think about, you know, where geoengineering governance should go, what this will provide us with is another example of how governance might be developed uh, from the bottom up. But I guess, you know, the risk is by lumping MCB in with, you know, coral, um, you know, stabilisation is that maybe you engender an acceptance of these technologies by stealth, by not, you know, being as forthcoming about what they might lead to down the track. Thank you very much. And, and thank you to Sylvia, Karen and Phil for joining us today. Um, and it's, a, it's a debate that is going to run for, for, for a considerable time. Um, and we hope you, you found this a useful and interesting contribution to that debate. Um, if you'd like to read a little bit more about this, Karen has written a, a, an excellent blog for us on C2G's website, which you can uh, have a look at. And there are a lot of links in there to um, the project and some of the research activities that are going on within the Great Barrier Reef project. Um, so this is the, the first, as I mentioned, of a series of these types of events that C2G will be hosting. And if you're interested in engaging in those in the future, uh, keep an eye on the website, which is c2g2.net. Um, next week, Janos Pastor is going to be hosting a campfire chat titled Exploring the Role of Trees in Large-Scale Carbon Dioxide Removal, and that's uh, on the 20th of July uh, at 12 o'clock Universal Time. So thank you very much. With that, we shall um, terminate the, uh, the conversation, and thank you for everybody who's joined us. <laughs>